So this is people of the free gift where we grab believers in their identity in Christ and equip them to reach those caught in religion. And we're glad you joined us. And if you're new here, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. So I'm going to paint a scenario for you. And it's one that you've probably experienced, or at least it would sound familiar to you. A knock comes on your door. And there's two uh, young men that are dressed in nice clothes, white shirt, black tie, name tags, say elder so-and-so. Um, perhaps maybe it's a family or maybe it's a couple of ladies that come to your door and uh, no particular uniform, but they say that they're a representative of either the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or perhaps the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Kingdom Hall, Watchtower Society. And they invite you in to a Bible discussion. And in the midst of just getting to know them, what comes out is you share with them that you're a Christian and from their lips you hear, I'm a Christian too. And it doesn't have to be missionaries from these groups. It could just be that you're at the park or you're at work or you're with a friend somewhere and they happen to be a part of one of these groups and you hear them saying those very same things. Sometimes it can take an adversarial tone in, in the sense of they say all of a sudden, you don't think I'm a Christian, do you? And what do you do in that moment? How do you react as a Christian that won't put them off, won't put up a barrier, won't put up a wall, but tells them the truth, tells them how you really feel? Uh, I find that a lot of times this situation comes up in which they're trying to make you feel uncomfortable in a sense because you are making a claim that they're not Christian, that they don't believe Orthodox Christian doctrine, but... You don't want to seem overly confrontational. And so sometimes Christians just pull back at this point. What do you do when this happens? And so I want to help answer that question for you as we go through this class. One of the greatest tactics that I have found is taking them to the Gospels. And the reason is... Because all of them want to claim Jesus. All of them want to claim themselves as part of Christianity. But a lot of them just don't know what Jesus actually taught. What the Bible actually says. And I want to focus in on the Gospels particularly because it's the life of ministry and teaching of Jesus. It's the death and resurrection of Jesus, which is the gospel. It is the foundational document, the manifesto, if you will, for Christianity, and especially when you get to those red letters. And we're going to use the King James Version. Why? Because that's the Bible that if any of these groups use a Bible, that's the Bible they use. That's the Bible they're going to carry with them. That's the Bible that's familiar to them. The words are going to sound familiar. And so that's what we want to do. We want to be a good missionary. We want the stumbling block to be Jesus and not anything else. And so... We're just going to take a section at a time, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the, the verses and the passages that you read and journaled on the previous session, and we're going to go over those, and I'm going to show you all the things that I found as I went through those as related to all of these groups, and I'm not even covering everything. Um, there's some great books called Reasoning from the Scriptures with uh, all of these different groups. There's other um other books that have been written by former members of these groups that do the same exact thing as what we're doing. And the scripture is just loaded with answers to the claims of these groups. And it's my personal conviction that the Holy Spirit anticipated every single heresy when he gave us the Bible. And even if it wasn't something that they were dealing with back then, he finds a way to word things in such a way that it answers every single one of their objections and their heresies. And so we're going to dive right in as we get into it. Next video, click here or here. Forgot to subscribe? Click here. Considering funding my next my projects? Click here for Patreon. And if you have ideas for future videos, Put it in the comments down below. 
So this is people of the free gift where we grab believers in their identity in Christ and equip them to reach those caught in religion. We're glad you joined us. And if you're new here, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. So the first topic that I see come up, and this comes up all over the place. And in this section that we were reading, it came up in spades. And that is faith versus works. And so the first place it comes up is in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. And I just want to emphasize here the standard that Jesus was laying out to escape judgment. In other words, Jesus took a couple of different routes. One, he would preach law to make us realize that we need him. And then as soon as the people felt that need for him, he would say, now come rest in me. Come and receive the grace that I want to give you. And so you've got both ends of the, the spectrum. And when you just have the Sermon on the Mount, and that's exactly what Mormons do. It's actually copy, copied verbatim in the King James Version, uh, from the King James Version in the Book of Mormon. And, and Jesus is supposed to have preached the exact same sermon here in the Americas when he came and visited the people. And so for a lot of Mormons, when it comes to what Jesus taught, the Sermon on the Mount really is what they have. And what they have then is law, Jesus preaching law. And so that's held up to them as the standard by which they need to be saved. So let's just take a few verses here and lay out what the standard really is then. And so in verse 22, he says, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Have you ever been angry with without cause? Have you ever said you're a fool? Jesus says you're in danger of judgment just from that one little thing. And in verse 28, he says, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Have you ever lusted after somebody who is not your spouse? Then Jesus says, you've already committed adultery, you've already violated the law, and you're already guilty, you're already in danger of judgment. And then in verse 48, he makes it even worse. He says, be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now here's the ironic thing, is that the LDS love verse 48. But they don't really want to hold to what it actually says. And there's verses in the Book of Mormon that teach the same thing, that you must repent of all of your sins. You must keep all of your covenants. You must re reach perfection, sinlessness, in order to go to the celestial kingdom. And But they don't want to hold Jesus at his word. Most of the time, they want to diminish sin. They want to diminish, and they say, well, I'm trying. And, well, I'll get there. And maybe, well, that's what the afterlife is for. And eventually, you know, but none of them have ever achieved it. None of them know that they're forgiven. None of them know that they're going to the celestial kingdom. None of them know anybody who has actually done this. And that's because Jesus was preaching law. He was trying to help us realize our need for him and that all of us fall short of the, the standard, including the Pharisees who were in the back row. And so now we go on to Matthew chapter 6, and Jesus says, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That Jesus is saying, the way that God forgives you is the way that we're supposed to forgive others, that God holds himself out as the model. Now, I want you to think about this. Now, it, imagine that you have a friend that's offended you, and they come and they say, I'm sorry that I did that. Imagine if you forgave them the way that the Mormon church and so many of these other groups believe that were forgiven by God. You would have to basically tell them, well, the proof would be 
if you never do that thing ever again. Then I would know that you truly are sorry for what you've done, but you've, you would never know that until they died. And so you would never be able to actually forgive them of that thing that they have done to offend you until they died. And you would never know for sure if they really had never done it or not, or they just maybe had never done it back to you again. But maybe that's because they just ditched you because they felt like you were not a good friend. You didn't forgive them. See, the LDS model of forgiveness in terms of reference to God, it doesn't work on a practical level. And neither does works righteousness. Moving on in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, verse 11, he says, If you then, being evil, know how to good give, give good gifts to, unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, good good things to them that ask them? God is the model gift giver. And I want you to think about, for those of you who follow works righteousness, or know those who do, Christmas is a great time to emphasize this idea of gifts. Now, I want you, want you to think about a father who pays good money for good gifts based off of what he's done to, to earn that money. And it's out of his resources. He puts the gifts under the tree. The kids are all excited. Christmas morning. And on the gift is a note saying, as soon as you mow the backyard, you can have this gift. As soon as you do the dishes, you can have this gift. That's not a gift anymore, is it? You see, we know what a gift is. We know how to give good gifts. But Jesus says, if we know how to good, give good gifts, how much more would the Father in heaven know how to give gifts? And he specifically said that salvation, that giving his son itself, himself, is the gift that he wants to give. We know how to give good gifts. So does God. So now, continuing on, Sermon on the Mount, verse 17 of chapter 7. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. In Luke, in 6.45, he says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. Now, what Jesus is saying is there's good trees and there's bad trees. And you can't get bad fruit out of a good tree, and you can't get good fruit out of, a good, out of a bad tree. All of us, before we accept Jesus and the gift that he gives us of his righteousness in exchange for our sin, we are bad trees. We can't bring forth good fruit. We cannot say, I am a good person. That's just not true. Anything that we bring out is for selfish reasons, selfish motives, and it's tainted by sin that hasn't been dealt with. So we need Jesus. He makes us good. He calls us good. And then we can bring forth good fruit. That's just the way it works. And this is a... a it, Going on in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 7, verse 21, he says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. And this has been a troubling verse to many. And the LDS, again, they love this verse because it's saying, well, see, you have to do, you have to do, you have to do. And not even everybody who does gets in. That's actually not what it's saying at all. It's not emphasizing the do. It's actually emphasizing the no. 
Do you know him? Do you have a relationship with him? And there is a verse that clarifies exactly what Jesus meant, meant when the Apostle Paul says in his letter to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 8, 3, But if any man love God, the same is known of him. You want God to know you? Then you need to love him. And so, going back to what Jesus said, what he's saying is, you never loved me. You did all of this stuff, but you never loved me. And John would clarify in his epistle, 1 John 4, 18, there's no fear in love because fear has to do with eternal judgment. And so, you can't love God if you don't know that you're forgiven. If you fear that he's going to judge you, you can't love him. And if you don't love him, he doesn't know you. And you're going to be cast out. Luke chapter 7, verse 41. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto them, Thou hast rightly judged. Wherefore I say unto thee, Her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. See, religion teaches you that the more you do for God and the less you sin, the more that you're going to, the better standing you're going to have with God. Jesus flipped that completely around in the scenario and he says, actually, let me tell you the truth. Those who realize their need for me more will love me more. Those who have greater sin that's forgiven will love me more. Those who think that they're okay could care less about me. Matthew chapter 9, verse 11. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And here again, Jesus clarifies and he says, Look, it's not those who think that they're okay. Those who think they're doing a good job. Those who say, I'm a good person. I didn't come for those people. I came to call sinners to repentance. I came for those who are sick. I came those who realize they have a need. That's who Jesus came for. And though that's who gets forgiven. Luke chapter 7 verse 50. And he said to the woman, Thy faith has saved you. Go in peace. I have to confess, when I was going through the Gospels, this was a gem that I had just discovered. This is amazing. This is Jesus declaring to somebody that their faith and their faith alone has saved them. That's awesome. John 5, 24. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but is passed from death unto life if you believe in jesus christ you have everlasting life and you shall not come into condemnation you have passed from death to life john chapter 6 verse 28 they said unto unto him, What shall we do, that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he has sent. And so those who want to emphasize it's about works, it's about works, Jesus answered for you what the work of God is. Now, the work of God is belief. And if I say it that way, 
you would think that you would emphasize the belief. But let me say it a different way. The work of God is belief. You see, it's God's work that of, it indicates possession, who it belongs to. It's actually God's work in you that you believe. And so it takes it even a step further. It's not just even faith alone. It's emphasizing that the faith, the belief itself is a gift, which Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says very clearly. Whose faith is it? It's actually Jesus' faith. It belongs to him. It's his gift to us so that we can believe. We can still reject it, but it's so that we can believe and we can receive that gift when it's offered to us. John chapter 8, verse 34. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. So you want to live by law? You want to get self you want to be self-righteous? You want to gain your own salvation? Jesus says, if you commit sin, you're the servant of sin. That's your identity, that's your status, that's your eventual, you know, destiny. You're a servant of sin. Where do servants of sin go? They get judged and they go to hell. So next topic that we come across in this section, is Jesus inferior to the Father? A lot of these groups, LDS, Jehovah's Witnesses, they want to emphasize to you that Jesus isn't God. That Jesus is maybe a God, but he's inferior to God. That he's not the same substance as God. That he was created by God that he's a spirit child of God, whatever it is that they that particular group believes. And one of the things, ways they do this is by pointing to verses from the Gospels in which Jesus is talking about submitting to the Father. And they point to these as if it proves that Jesus is not God. Here's how you deal with those. John chapter 5, verse 30. I can of mine own self this is Jesus speaking. I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. Was Jesus really saying that he's not able to do anything? Here's the deal. Jesus is God, but he's also man. When he came and incarnated into this life when he lived in a human flesh he was fully man he had to walk in our steps in our shoes and he had to fill our place so he could die in our place he was our kinsman redeemer and so in the flesh as a human he says just like he says of us in our reality i can of mine own self do Nothing but what I hear and see the Father do. That's the thing which I do. And so Jesus was identifying with us in his humanity. Everything he did, he did by the will of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, the same exact way that you and I can as a believer that's indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And he did it perfectly. Which in and of itself proves that he is actually God. Next video, click here or here. Forgot to subscribe? Click here. Considering funding my next my projects? Click here for Patreon. And if you have ideas for future videos, put it in the comments down below. Well, this is People of the Free Gift, where we grab believers in their identity in Christ and equip them to reach those caught in religion. We're glad you joined us. And if you're new here, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Faith versus works. And uh, we're going to really hit this and the Trinity really hard as we go through this class. Because those two issues, more than anything else... Um, are the, the two issues, the two pillar issues that separate the cults from, 
from biblical Christianity, and this is probably the most unifying theme, faith versus works, or grace, and teaching them about grace. So, in Matthew 10, 8, he said, Jesus said, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely you have received, freely give. And uh, you might pick up that this has uh, become the motto of my uh, ministry called People of the Free Gift. Freely you have received, freely give. We are called to give freely because we have received freely. Again, there's this modeling that God has done for us that we're supposed to mimic him, imitate him, be like him. And the way that we give to others is based off of how we have received. And we have received freely, so therefore we give freely. John chapter 9, verse 39 and Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, that they which see might not see, and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words, and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remains. So what Jesus is saying is there's a contrast here. And this has everything to do with this whole language of gift. Jesus came to save sinners. A huge requirement of that is that you have to acknowledge that you're a sinner. You have to acknowledge that there's something wrong. You have to acknowledge that you're sick in order for a doctor to treat you. And so Jesus said, if you guys would just say that we're sinners and that we're blind then you would be able to see. I would be able to help you. I'd be able to cure you. I'd be able to save you. But because you insist on saying, we see, therefore your sin remains. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And when I dug into the Greek on this one, I found something really fascinating. When you take those words, um, for I will give you rest in the Greek, what you actually come out with is something more comparable to this. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will cause or permit you to cease from any movement or labor in order to recover and collect your strength. And I would encourage you to, to compare what I just said to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 10, when it's talking about Jesus being our rest and entering into his rest. Matthew fourteen thirty. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. This is Peter. After he saw Jesus walking on the water, he says, I want to walk on the water too. Jesus says, well, step on out, son. And he does. And at first he's walking on the water while his eyes are on Jesus. But when he starts looking around him and he looks at the waves, he looks at the wind, he looks at the storm, he gets scared and he starts to sink. And he cries out one thing, Jesus, save me. He didn't say, Jesus, teach me how to save myself. Jesus, help me save myself. Jesus, save me. When we talk about salvation, sometimes we lose sight of the, the fact that the verb of that word is save. And a person only cries out, save me, when they can't save themselves. When there's nothing that they can do to save themselves. That's the job of a savior, is to save. Not to help save, but to save. And again, in Luke 9.56, For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. You know, one thing about this is that legalism, living by the law, living by trying to have enough good works, it actually ends up destroying lives. Because... 
Nobody ever knows when they've reached, they've done enough, they're good enough for God to save them. Nobody ever reaches that point. We're all just held in suspense until the judgment day. And most of the time, if you really look at the standards that are being held up, no one's going to make it. The law destroys lives. The law brings death. But Jesus came to give life and to save us. Luke 10, 20, Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. The names of the apostles, and I would say by extension, us and anybody who believes, are already written in heaven. We have eternal life. Luke eleven nine through thirteen, and I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given to you; seek, and he shall, you shall find; knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him that knocks, it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? We talked about this, I believe, in Matthew's Gospel in one of the last sessions, and how we know how to give good gifts. We know that when we give gifts, it's not having to do with anything that's earned. We're giving it because we want to and because we love that person. And their job is to receive the gift, not think about paying us back, not thinking about um, or what did I do to earn this. Their job is just to simply receive the gift. But Jesus goes a step further in the Gospel of Luke, and he ties it in to the fact that the Holy Spirit is available for the asking. The Holy Spirit is what is given when a, a person believes in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit actually comes and indwells them, lives inside them. You have the God of the universe living inside you, and it's available for the asking. It's a gift that God only gives. He doesn't pay it out. He only gives it, and we can only receive it. So moving on. To Sabbath issues for those groups that want to emphasize that the Sabbath is the, the day that God established. Let's see how Jesus dealt with the Sabbath once again. In Matthew chapter 12, at that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were in hunger and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was hungered, and that they that were with him, how he entered into the house of God, and did eat the showbread which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priest? Have ye not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you, that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, I will have mercy." and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is the Lord even of the Sabbath day. And when he was departed thence, he went into the synagogue, and behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days? That they might accuse him. And he said unto them, What man shall be there among you that shall have one sheep? And if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold of it and lift it out? How much more, then is a man better than a, sa than a sheep. Wherefore is it lawful to do well on the Sabbath days? So Jesus points to the fact that all of these people who say you shouldn't work and they follow all of these laws, these strict laws, if they're, if they're risking losing one of their possessions, namely one of their animals, one of their sheep, they will work and violate the Sabbath or the traditions of the Sabbath, not the spirit of the Sabbath, but they will violate that in order to save that sheep. And so Jesus is pointing out once again their hypocrisy. 
that they want to point and hold him up to the standard, which wasn't God's standard, it was man's standard. And once again, he points out their hypocrisy and says, hey, if you guys can do this, I can do this. And neither of them actually is violating the Sabbath. Next video, click here or here. Forgot to subscribe? Click here. Considering funding my next my projects? Click here for Patreon. And if you have ideas for future videos, put it in the comments down below. Well, this is People of the Free Gift, where we grab believers in their identity in Christ and equip them to reach those caught in religion. We're glad you joined us. And if you're new here, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. So the first passage we're going to go to is Matthew chapter 20. And in Matthew chapter 20, verse 1, Jesus says, For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And when he, when he went out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said unto them, Go you also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man has hired us. He said unto them, Go you also into my vineyard, and whatsoever is right that shall you receive so so when evening was come the lord of the vineyard saith unto the steward call the laborers and give them their hire beginning from the last unto the first and when they came that they were hired about the eleventh hour they received every man a penny but when the first came they supposed that they should have received more and they likewise received every man a penny and when they had received it they murmured against the god good man of the house saying these last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst thou not agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil, because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen." This parable uh, deals with a couple of different things, and one of them is this um, harsh feelings that those who are in religion or legalism or workspace righteousness systems feel about so-called deathbed conversions, um, like the thief on the cross. Uh, that kind of scenario isn't one that really these groups believe in, uh, much less embrace, as do uh, biblical Christians. And that's exactly what you have happening. That you have some of these people that the, the master hired into his vineyard. At the very end of the day, they got paid the exact same amount as the people who had been working all day. And it also goes to show it's not about when you get saved. It's not about how how long you've worked. It's not about how much effort, how much you've done, all that kind of stuff that plays into the ultimate prize or payment, which is salvation. It has to do with the vineyard owner and him being good and him calling you to work in his vineyard. That's all that this really is about. And Jesus is clearly the owner of the vineyard, okay? Um, and if not Jesus, then God. And then Jesus is the son of the landowner, according to the other parables anyway. Anyway, um, that's de that issue. Then we move on to Matthew twenty twenty eight, 28, where he says, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto you, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And so Jesus' life is the ransom, not our life, not our works, not our efforts, none of that. Uh, we aren't even playing a part in here. The, the, the picture of a ransom is that we've been held captive and there is a price that is hanging over our heads and God is the one who comes and pays that price, not us. He sets us free. We didn't free ourselves. The picture is very clear. Now, Matthew twenty four thirteen, when Jesus says, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. 
how does this fit in with this whole idea of faith alone? And that Jesus being the one who saves us, not our efforts. Is this really just talking about the fact that, you know, once you get saved, then you have to keep yourself saved and you have to keep yourself in good standing with God or else you can lose your salvation. And that there's many who just kind of forfeit their salvation and all that kind of other stuff that people talk about. I don't think so. I think really if you want to put it straight, I think Jesus is saying you're going to be able to tell the true believers from the false believers because false believers, they fall away. They weren't believing for the right reasons. They weren't really believing in the right things and or they were trusting in their own works righteousness to save them. Whatever it was, they don't endure to the end. When hard times come, some fall away. When false teachers come, some fall away. When, you know, different things in life come, certain temptations or the cares of the world come, some fall away. And John, in his epistle, he says, some of them went out from us and to show that they were never really of us. And he was talking about the false teachers. And so that is really, I think, what Jesus is getting at here. In the midst of persecution, the one who endures to the end. I think another way you can look at this is if I have a hold of you, you're going to endure to the end. Nothing's going to be able to shake you. Nothing's going to be able to separate you. I have you in the palm of my hand, as he said elsewhere in John 10. Next video, click here or here. Forgot to subscribe? Click here. Considering funding my next projects? Click here for Patreon. And if you have ideas for future videos, put it in the comments down below. So this is People of the Free Gift, where we grab believers in their identity in Christ and equip them to reach those caught in religion. We're glad you joined us. And if you're new here, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Luke 18, verse 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not as the other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. I, I got to tell you, I can't think of something that Jesus could have taught that would have been more to the point when it comes to LDS. If you just substitute LDS in place of Pharisee in this, I... I I got to tell you, it fits like a glove. They fast, you know, at least once a month. They give tithes of all that they possess. And they very much are looking even to their other fellow LDS people and saying, God, I'm thankful that I'm not doing all the stuff that that guy over there is doing. I'm thankful that I'm doing the right things. And they definitely look upon everyone else with the attitude of superiority and pride that they're a part of the one true church. And I, I, I like how it even says in here and said he prayed with himself. I, 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 you know, but then you have this tax collector, this despised of society who's on the other side saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's all he says, and he went away justified, meaning just as if he had not done it. His account was paid in full, that he is right with God. Luke eighteen nineteen, And Jesus said unto him, Why callest me thou good? None is good, save one, that is God. And we could talk about this in reference to the divinity of Jesus, but just in reference to whether or not it's even possible for humans to save themselves or play a part in their salvation or any of that stuff, Jesus answers it very clearly. There's only one who's good, and that's God. Luke 18, 42 
This is the second time we've seen in the Gospels where Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight. He's talking to blind Bartimaeus. Thy faith has saved thee. Present tense, saved. Right at that moment, Bartimaeus was saved. And it was because of his faith and his faith alone. And it wasn't even salvation he was asking for. He was asking for healing. But because of his faith in Jesus, he was saved. Luke 19, 9 and 10. Then Jesus said unto them, This day is salvation come to this house. For so much as he also is the son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. This is Zacchaeus, that tax collector. Once again, we have the tax collectors as the heroes. And he says, this day salvation is coming to this house. Meaning, Zacchaeus, you are saved because of what you just said. And you're seeking after me. And I'm coming over to your house. And it's come to this house. That has to do with this idea of household. And the fact that God is going to be at work in Zacchaeus' household for salvation. And the other thing he says is the reason why I came is to seek and to save that which was lost. Has Jesus accomplished what he came to do? He came to save. Are we going to allow him to save? Or are we going to keep on trying to save ourselves? John 20 verse 30. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So John tells you that he wrote his gospel for the express purpose that we would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that in that belief, through believing, that we might have life through his name. Again, that's present tense life, eternal life, through our belief in Jesus Christ. The next issue is repentance, and it's kind of having to do and following along with this idea of faith versus works. So in Luke 17, verse 3, Take heed to yourselves, if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. And if he trespass against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn against, again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. This gets to this idea of what is repentance. Because some of these groups, LDS especially, define repentance as completely forsaking all of your sins. And all of your sins, meaning that you can't just repent of one sin. You have to repent of all sins in order to properly repent. Spencer Kimball, in his book, The Miracle of Forgiveness, and Spencer Kimball was one of the former prophets of the LDS Church, he wrote that if you have to repent, if you have to confess sins, then you haven't repented. It's not until you've actually reached a point in which you don't ever do any of those things and you don't even think about doing those things, that's when you've repented. What does Jesus say? He says that it's possible that a person would have to repent seven times in a day for the exact same thing. That means that they've re they did it. They've repented. They did it again. They repented. They did it. They repented again. So repentance all the word means is a change of mind, okay? It's a change in direction in which you turn from the sins and you turn towards Christ. That's what it means. It doesn't mean you physically don't do all of those things. Now, is that what the intention is? Is that where your heart is? Yeah, I don't want to do this again. Now, this guy, all of us would question whether he's truly repenting, but Jesus says, hey, he repented. He actually expressed sorrow for what he did but then he keeps on doing it again why because we're fallen humans we only can truly change from who we are and from our sin by the power of jesus inside of us not by ourselves next video click here or here forgot to subscribe click here considering funding my next my projects click 
here for Patreon. And if you have ideas for future videos, put it in the comments down below.